Uh, this afternoon's session continues to build on the uh, three really good uh, sessions this morning, which had a diversity of speakers from around the region, uh, and we continue that theme. Uh, we'll continue on, and I think uh, we'll ask uh, Dr Richard Dunley, our chair, to make some uh, framing remarks to frame this session and build upon the previous uh, three. Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much. Um, we've had three great sessions so far, and we've learned quite a lot about that, both the history of Kakadu and how it's changed um, over the period since its original inception in 1991 and first first um, sort of occurrence in 1993. Um, and one of the things that, that I think is really interesting is this way it, it has changed and the environment around it um, has also changed. Um, and one of the things which I think has, has come through uh, is something perhaps that speaks more broadly to, to naval exercises, and that is, is this question of what exactly are they for? Um, and we've heard very different kind of takes um, and it is interesting to see how different navies in different countries are looking at these, often through similar lenses, but occasionally through, through sort of slightly different ones. Um, and I'm really interested to hear the views of the panel today, uh, this, this final panel, which perhaps uh, have slightly different takes, um, particularly uh, those of, of, of nations which are not necessarily directly in, in the region itself. Um, and in particular, looking at this, this question of, of sort of what's been described in the broader conference program as being cooperative and collaborative regional partnerships, um, which has always been very much at the heart of, of, of what Kakadu is. Um, and then the perhaps broader picture um, of, of naval diplomacy as uh, sort of more of a potentially a tool of deterrence um, and sort of being seeing it at a, perhaps a higher level in terms of, of um, uh, sort of pushing up the span of maritime tasks and this understanding of, of perhaps more direct war fighting. Um, and obviously there's always been elements of this, but, but perhaps there, we're seeing a change in focus of navies over this period of time, um, and does Kakadu and exercises more generally need to change? Um, and within that, I think you then, there's some, some interesting things to think about in terms of, of who the audience is for a lot of this. Um, what, what are we trying to achieve? Um, and whether or not actually there's space for, for different exercises to do different things with different partners. Um, and within that more broadly, the, the question of how it fits into to the wider diplomacy. We heard from Beck Stratting, uh, who gave us a wonderful overview of some of the, um, the sort of uh, multilateral frameworks uh, of the architecture of the Indo-Pacific, um, and I think there's, there's some, some interesting things to, to be pulling out about how naval exercises fit into that and whether or not we want to be tying them in hugely closely. Um, but I'm really interested to hear the perspectives um, of, of a range of countries, uh, some of whom are very much from the region and some of whom are, are perhaps uh, slightly f sort of broader Indo-Pacific powers. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Commander Eddie Joffrin uh, from the Royal Brunei Navy. Uh, Commander Joffrin joined the Royal Brunei Navy in 2001 and his early career saw him serve as executive officer of the waspata class fast attack craft, Pembrew. An executive officer fleet headquarters later went on to such appointments as the Principal Warfare Officer, Fleet Headquarters, and eventually Commanding Officer, Fleet Headquarters. A graduate of the Command and Staff College, he has undertaken training in both the United Kingdom and Australia. He is a qualified International Principal Warfare Officer with further qualifications in defence, instructional techniques, and electromagnetic spectrum management. He holds Masters of International Security and was appointed as the Chief of Staff N3 Operations in 2020. Uh, but I think just lifting a, a theme of the previous session where you're talking about relationships and where they, they may generate, just prior to it, we were talking uh, the last time we crossed paths was on the deck of his offshore patrol vessel, uh, where Brunei has an incredible amount to teach us about how to operate that. But I think the key there, out of the chief, between the uh, Deputy Chief and the Chief of uh, the Royal Brun, uh, Brunei Navy, agreed to support the first submarine visit to Brunei since World War II for, for us, and we were able to achieve that within a couple of months of that time period. So that's, uh, I think, a, a tangible asset of what that does in those relationships. So, Eddie, we welcome you to the, um, the podium. Uh, thank you very much, uh, sir. Very good afternoon to uh, everyone, sirs, ma'am. I am again uh, Commander Eddie Joffrin from the Royal Brunei Navy. 
And on behalf of our Navy, I uh, would like to extend our appreciation for this opportunity to share uh, our Navy's experiences in Exercise Kakadu. And on a personal level, I'm also thankful for the opportunity to reminisce on Exercise Kakadu 2012. Uh, back then, I was the EXO on board our uh, KDB Darul Aman participating, where I had seen uh, firsthand the vast wealth of knowledge and experience gained from the eyes of the RBN, which had uh, just recently acquired the patrol vessel platform at the time. For today, I'll begin with an introduction to the Royal Brunei Navy, followed by uh, the RBN's participation in Exercise Kakadu, the value of Exercise Kakadu to RBN, and Exercise Kakadu's contribution to the Royal Brunei Navy's mission before concluding. Brunei is a nation located in Borneo with direct access to the South China Sea where we border East Malaysia uh, and Kalimantan of Indonesia. Like many maritime nations, we rely on a peaceful, stable and prosperous maritime domain. To that end, the RBN was established under the Royal Brunei Armed Forces on the 14th of June, 1965. The RBN envisions to become a formidable Navy and a reliable partner towards achieving its mission of defending the maritime sovereignty and territorial integrity of Brunei Darussalam. With that, the RBN's roles mainly consists of uh, the following. As I previously mentioned, uh, the Royal Brunei Navy's acquisition of the PV platform gave the Royal Brunei Navy the opportunity to expand its capacity and conduct its first operational participation uh, in Exercise Kakadu 2020, 2012. And I fondly remember Exercise Kakadu 2012 for the opportunity to work closely with a vast range of capabilities and experience the full spectrum of three-dimensional warfare. As uh, the officers and crew jokingly recalled uh, back then, anti-air defense exercise for breakfast, surface firing for lunch, and KSAC cereals for dinner. Other activities within exercise... Uh, other activities within exercise Kakadu, such as uh, sport interaction during the Kakadu Cup 2012 activities in preparation for the exercise at sea and valuable interaction between senior delegation and ship's captains provided valuable opportunities to establish people-to-people -people relationships between the crew of participating ships and facilities enhance sharing of best practices. In addition to operational participation, RBN participated in Exercise Kakadu as ex-con staff in 2018, where we had two representatives from our Navy attend the exercise in Darwin as exercise controller trainees to gain exposure as ex-con staff, underlying one of the largest multilateral maritime exercises in the region. The exercise in 2018 emphasized humanitarian assistance and disaster relief planning as a core substance of Exercise Kakadu in which Multiple seminars were held around this topic. In line with HADR planning, all ex-con trainees were involved in a HADR planning exercise as a platform to share their experiences and knowledge on the matter based on a simulated natural disaster on an island. Kakadu 2018 provided opportunities for the RBN officers to contribute towards uh, force planning as the foreign ex-con. And additionally, RBN officers worked together with other nation counterparts to jointly design exercise scenario injects during Kakadu 2018. To the RBN, participating in exercise Kakadu is a significant milestone and holds its value to the RBN from three broad aspects of operational exposure, training, and aspects of naval diplomacy. The value from operational exposure as experienced in 2012 comes with the daily warfare exercises and the range of capabilities present in Exercise Kakadu building capacity for our Navy as KDB Dorolaman during that time was able to work towards her full operational capability. 
The rigor of Excise Kakadu also worked towards testing the limits of this new capability acquired by our Navy at the time and for her crew to discover the, their full potential. Moreover, the participating assets of, during 2012 included some capabilities that are not normally available to the RBN. The opportunity to work alongside these capabilities such as the submarines and fighter jets are valuable experiences towards achieving seamless interoperability. Training value comes from the overall deployment to Darwin for Exercise Kakadu from Brunei. This entail entails the test of their mental resilience in participation and valuable experiences that are not easily replicated. RBN's participation as ex-con staff also provided significant training value from the exposure to HADR planning and exercise planning through sharing ses sessions amongst participating naval officers. And lastly, the value of uh, naval diplomacy is based on the dynamics of the current operating environment that requires navies to co cooperate with one another in operations and training. The foundations of interoperability are built on years of relationship building capacity building, and level of mutual trust and confidence. This value is maximized through operational participation in Exercise Kakadu, where uninhibited interaction amongst participants facilitates relationship building. <clears throat> As we all are aware, the maritime domain has become uh, more interconnected and security challenges are no longer confined within the nation's border. It is therefore an endeavor that must be addressed through cooperation. For us to do so, it requires a level of interoperability and understanding honed by years of practice and an underlying level of mutual trust and confidence. With this, we see Exercise Kakadu as a form of preparation for its participants to operate in an increasingly globalized maritime environment and addresses common security and humanitarian challenges. To reiterate, RBN's mission is to defend the maritime sovereignty and territorial integrity of Brunei Darussalam. In achieving this mission, we rely on the three key strategic pillars of defense framework, comprising of deterrence and response, defense diplomacy, and holistic defense. Where deterrence and response is a pillar of readiness and capability in addressing maritime security challenges, the pillar of defense diplomacy builds on stable and strong working relationships, fostering mutual trust, confidence, and capacity building. And where holistic defense captures the essence of interoperability and working closely with others in achieving a common goal. The Royal Brunei Navy realizes the values that the many activities of Kakadu provide and how those values contribute towards our mission as we work together to build capacity, long-lasting ties, and consistently make an effort towards achieving interoperability towards ensuring a peaceful and st stable security environment. And with that, I conclude uh, my presentation. Thank you once again for your time and opportunity to share our experience in Kakadu. Thank you. Thank you, Commander Joffrin. I uh, would next like to invite uh, Captain Lisa Hun from uh, New the Royal New Zealand Navy. Uh, Captain Hun is the Assistant Chief of Navy, uh, Strategy and Engagement in, naval, in the Naval Staff. She joined the Royal New Zealand Navy in 1990, and during her 30-year career has served at sea as a Warfare Officer primarily in the Naval Combat Force and gained maritime operational experience in the Arabian Gulf and Asia-Pacific regions. Her most recent sea experience was in command of HMNZS Tamana, where she became the first woman to command an RNZN frigate, and Tamana was a participant in Exercise Kakadu 2018, where Captain Hunt also performed the duties of Commander Task Group 628.1. In between periods at sea, she has served in capability and staff roles with an emphasis on communications and information warfare. Captain Hunt is an alumni of the University of Auckland the United States Naval College, the Asia Pacific Centre for Strategic Studies, and the Whitecliffe College of Arts and Design. In 2020, she completed her Masters in Defence and Strategic Studies through Deakin University, where she was awarded the prize for academic excellence. She is a Fellow of the Australian War College and is currently serving as the Assistant Chief of Navy, Strategy and Engagement. 
Lisa, welcome to the stage. Good afternoon, everybody. Just checking, I can't see because of the lights to see if everyone's actually still, still awake. Oh, there's a familiar face. Oh, I can't tell any lies now because the planner is here from where my, I attended Kakadu. Um, look, I begin my remarks today by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Ko uika te maunga, ko na awa irua te awa, ko te kurai atura te whenua, ko te tō moana te marae, ko iwi heramana te iwi, ko Lisa Han Toku Ingua, Tihei Māori Ora. Good afternoon, Tomro Oeli, sir, and sir. I didn't even get to see your name. Our distinguished guests, fellow panel members, uh, and conference attendees, both in place here, thanks for turning up, and those online, assuming there are some. I'd first like to thank uh, Vice Admiral Noonan for the invitation uh, uh, to attend this and be part of this panel today. Uh, and also to my Sea Power uh, Centre mates, uh, thanks very much for the invite. It really is a privilege to be able to stand here today and a great opportunity uh, to travel again to Australia after the impacts of COVID-19. It's been 18 months since I departed the War College and I'm glad to be back. Uh, and I've also had these amazing reunions already just in the last day. Uh, as I was preparing for this speech, I'm going to take a slightly different tack. Hopefully that'll keep, uh, keep you a little bit uh, awake this afternoon. Um, and that is, aside from sort of gathering facts and figures or giving you a bit more of the strategic narrative, I really was reflecting quite a lot on my own personal experiences from Exercise Kakadu 2018. It was one of the highlights of my deployment uh, that year in command, and um, so I'm more than happy to uh, share some of those more personal experiences with you. I thought the best way uh, to approach these remarks was really just to, to share those personal reflections uh, and talk about my experience, so it is really my personal experience uh, from that exercise, uh, and then ultimately how the value of exercise kakadu, uh, how I see it personally, then translates into our mission achievement, which is to advance New Zealand's interests from the sea. To achieve this, I'd therefore like to focus on three factors, and I believe this that I believe uh, contribute to the success in building and maintaining interoperability between our navies. And when I say our navies, I mean, <coughs> of course, between Australia and New Zealand, but the broader international collective who participate in Exercise Kakadu. Uh, these three, three things are people-to-people -people relationships, creating cultural understanding, and generating shared warfighting experience. But before I address these, I will start with just a few facts and figures, and actually it's already been said. Uh, we, we've been uh, attending Kakadu now as the Royal New Zealand Navy since 2012. I was actually just chatting to my panellist uh, mate uh, from Brunei around reflecting on 2012 uh, and in his memory of a New Zealand uh, person who brought HMNZ to Kaha, one of our ANZAC class frigates, and uh, also Endeavour was there in 2012. Uh, 2018 is probably the year I'm most familiar with, and we've already mentioned that, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that piece, and I'm happy to have a further conversation on that in questions, uh, but also uh, at, any, at any other stage if anyone wants to talk to me outside of this formal panel. So the three things, uh, addressing the three things. First of all, people-to-people um, -people relationships. I think that's been a common theme today uh, and can, cannot be underestimated. Uh, Establishing strong people-to-people -people relationships with like-minded navies is a core aspect of successful security alliances and partnerships. Without strong people-to-people -people connections, there is no foundation on which to build understanding or trust, and trust is key to collaboration and effective multinational warfighting at sea. Exercise Kakadu is an event that enables the building and maintenance of these connections, and for the Royal New Zealand Navy, reconnections with Aussie mates. The Royal New Zealand Navy is fortunate to train in Australia and during our sailors' careers, and for me personally, uh, these, con these connections are continually reforged as we re-meet together, and today is an example of doing that. Personally, I got to serve at sea in command during Exercise Kakatu 2018, as has been mentioned, and I got to do that alongside other Australian commanding officer friends that I had grown up with through the various training courses I'd completed over the years. 
The strengths of these connections speak to the kaitiakitanga, or stewardship, of the Anzac spirit, which was forged, be forged between New Zealand and Australia during wartime. And this spirit remains strong, even if it is a little tested on the sports fields, where naval sports competition always reflect national level sports rivalries. Exercise Kakadu also facilitates people to people connections with other participating nations. And the Royal New Zealand Navy gains significant benefit in this regard through participation in Exercise Kakadu. With 27 nations involved in 2018, that provided the opportunity for me to engage professionally and socially with a broad range of participants across the Indo-Pacific and to create and build connections. Even after the disruption of the last two years of COVID-19, some of these connections, I suggest, are being reforged here during Indopac 2022. To build lasting connections, the next factor I consider to be valuable is, uh, sorry, for interoperability is cultivating cultural understanding so that we as leaders can learn how each other thinks, how we fight, so that we can cooperate better at sea. I completed my warfare training in Australia too many years ago to count now, but, uh, and, oh, hang on, I've lost my track. Uh, it, which meant, of course, as Commander Task Group, I could step in seamlessly into that role, uh, which was a great privilege, and then uh, leverage the knowledge of tactics, doctrines, and procedure, and how my Aussie mates thought, um, for delivering a great effect for Exercise Kakadu 2018. And of course, I'm going to stay up here and say loud that, uh, that our task group was, of course, the best. Uh, working with this task group enabled me to learn how other commanding officers thought. I guess one hard lesson I learnt uh, was, uh, from my other counterparts, was that all of us have quite different appetites for uh, risk. Uh, and one key hard lesson that I will share with you is that um, you need to remember that other commanding officers don't necessarily want to manoeuvre in close formation at the end of a long free pay period at 500 yards rather than 1,000 yards, perhaps, as an example. Uh, so I learnt that the hard way, but I think I got a fairly good telling off by the particular captain that was uncomfortable with that um, after we'd already pre-forged our relationship, so I took that feedback uh, very positively and said, you're totally right, I'm so sorry about that. Um, because we forget that uh, New Zealanders and uh, Australians always work close together and 500 yards is actually a fairly large different difference, a large distance between ships at times. And finally, look, the third and perhaps most ob obvious factor that's uh, valuable is shared warfighting experiences. And you may say, as a warfighter, why did I talk about this as the third one and not the first one? And I say that because, basically, I believe that people people to connections and also the shared cultural understanding of how we think uh, as security practitioners um, is actually the key enabler to building a confident and competent warfighters within shared warfighting experiences. Generating these high-end warfighting competencies for the New Zealand Navy sailors at sea is crucial to our mission to ensure that we build and maintain credible maritime combat capability uh, with our Naval Combat Force, HMNZS Takaha and Tamana, and in our new maritime sustainment capability, HMNZS Aotearoa. Exercises such as Kakadu, with a significant scope of international participation, are one of the few activities that offer the Royal New Zealand Navy this opportunity to train and build high-end warfighting skills alongside like-minded security partners. These experiences and skills are then brought back by our sailors and translated as knowledge throughout our fleet, which serve us well for delivering other non-combat roles that our Navy is also responsible for. So to conclude, given the time of the afternoon that it is and that I have far more distinguished panel members sitting to my left that would like to speak, uh, the factors I've mentioned above, I believe, are important and deliver value to the Royal New Zealand Navy and the New Zealand Defence Force. Participation in Exercise Kakadu, where people-to-people -people connections are built, cultural understanding is cultivated, and warfighting experiences are shared, are the key enablers to ensuring that we are ready to join in with the Royal, New Royal Australian Navy, other security partners, to contribute to peace and security efforts within our region. New Zealand's interests rely on the stability of the rules-based global order. This has also been a common theme we've talked about today, and we remain committed to ensuring we provide a meaningful contribution towards these efforts. 
So I'd like to close by quoting a Māori whakatauki or saying, which I think is appropriate to support what I've talked about today. E hara tuaku toa, e te toa takatahi, engare he toa takatini. My strength is not that of an individual, but that of the collective. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Lisa. We're going to go now to uh, our close uh, friends from uh, Japan. Uh, Captain Kazushi Yokota is the uh, Director of Plans and Program Division. His extensive operational experience includes command of the uh, destroyer Kurosami and command of Escort Division 8. His shore postings include Executive Assistant to the Chief of Maritime Staff, Chief of C4I Systems and Deputy Director of Plans in the Program Division, MSI. He's a graduate of the Japanese Maritime Self-Defence Force Staff College. He holds qualifications in electrical engineering and a Master of Science in National Security and Strategic Studies from the United States Naval War College. And in March 2022, he was appointed in his current position as Director of Plans and Program Division. Konnichiwa, good day. Uh, hey, ladies and gentlemen, and also the uh, brother and sisters and mates. So the, uh, it is a tremendous honor for me uh, to be here. Uh, my family really, really invite me because I can visit such a beautiful city, uh, Shironi. And also, I'm aware of uh, New Zealand fortune now. I invite New Zealand because yeah, New Zealand and Japan are same size and also the, we have a lot of the earthquake and also the uh, seafood and also the uh, volcano. But you know, the big difference is uh, location, you know? <laughs> so the, we always thinking we want to exchange the location. And uh, <laughs> please uh, have the experience of our uh, very severe security environment. <laughs> anyway, uh, joke aside, uh, uh, I want to do that, my presentation. So the uh, next slide. Okay. So exercise Kakadu started 30 years ago in 1993. Four countries participated in the first exercise. The 14th Kakadu 2018 was participated by 26 countries. I believe that an increasing in the number of participating countries reflects that Kakadu has been growing in the importance under the excellent, uh, excellent leadership of the Royal Australian Navy. Then, more navies have been aware of it. The JMSDF has also taken part in this great exercise every time since 2008 to gain many fruitful results. As Kakadu has significantly contributed to ensuring peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region, I will talk about how Kakadu has had a positive impact on the JMSDF's missions. Before I talk about Kakadu, please allow me to review relations between Japan and Australia regarding peace and stability of the Indo-Pacific region, rather than simply those between the JMSDF and the Royal Australian Navy. 108 years ago, Japan fought throughout the World War I as a member of the Allies, which also included Australia, the Imperial Japanese Navy engaged in various missions, which included deploying many ships, such as the battleship Satsuma, the cruisers Yahagi, and the Hirado. They conducted a two patrol in, in the Indo-Pacific region, protecting the Albany convoy of Australia and the New Zealand troops for the Gallipoli campaign. And there also the second special squadron played an important role in the, in the Mediterranean theater of operations. Among them, protect, protecting the Albany convoy by the Japanese battleship Ibuki had a deep connection with Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. In order to respond to the uh, German East Asia squadron, which included the German battleship SMS Emden, thought to be very destructive at that time, 
The Japanese battleship Ibuki was deployed to the Indo-Pacific region with 11 Japanese uh, combatant ships, such as the battle battleship Satsuma and the cruiser Kurama. In the end, Ibuki succeeded in escorting Anzac until it reached Egypt safely. The Albany convoy delayed its departure to November 1, 1914, to wait a while until it rendezvoused with Ibuki. Ibuki finally protected the convoy until it safely arrived at the destination, which enabled HMS, HMAS Sydney to make SMS Emden incapable of carrying out her missions anymore. So why did the Japanese battleship Ibuki successfully escort the Albany convoy back then? I think that it is because the Allies share a sense of value based on the Anglo-Japanese alliance and there was interoperability among them. I do believe that the Allies shares a sense of values to be preserved in the Indo-Pacific region and interoperability work well among them in carrying out operations in accordance with observance of these values. In general, it is said that the interoperability can be developed by entities sharing equipment, procedure, and minds. At that time, the Japanese, Australian, UK, and New Zealand navies shared equipment, tactics, and procedures, kind of TTPs, related to their operation as well as mines or common sense of value, which I think enables them to closely work together to achieve demanding missions. As we can learn from the history, in order for different navies to work together, it is important to share the sense of value and develop interoperability. We can promote that on the occasion of Kakadu. We work together to improve interoperability to solve problems facing participating navies. I am certain that the aim can be surely realized through Kakadu hosted by the, by the Royal Australian Navy not only through training at sea, but also through various exchanges as well, including drinking, participants have an opportunity to discuss work together, share other countries' challenges and awareness, improving on interoperability. I believe that it is the biggest significance on Kakadu. The JMSDF has developed, uh, sorry, I skipped my manuscript. <laughs> Since the JMSDS participated in Kakadu for the first time in 2008, we have worked together with other countries on the occasion of exercise and operations. For example, it was symbolic that the JMSDF destroyer JS Kirisame I was, uh, was invited to take part in the ceremony commemorating the 100th anniversary of the sailing of the first convoy of ships from Albany in 2014. I was then the commanding officer of the destroyer and it was honor and privilege to attend it. It was a historic event as is the case with the Japanese and Australian Prime Minister's joint statement where Japan and Australia, which had engaged each other during the World War II, the US, the UK, New Zealand, and other Pacific countries got together to work together once again for peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region. I never forget that day, uh, maybe overcome the history and the leaping to the working together. And also I deeply appreciation to the Royal Australian Navy's uh, generosity to our lost sailors in the Sydney, like a Kutabo. Thank you very much. After the ceremony, the JMSDF, the Royal Australian Navy, and the Royal New Zealand Navy conducted a high-end trilateral exercise made possible by interoperability, which we have developed through Kakadu. I, it was our interoperability that allowed us to conduct replenishment at sea with the New Zealand Navy's AOE and high-end tactical training, including the ASW operation. The JMSDF has developed interoperability through Kakadu and various bilateral and multilateral exercises hosted by other navies, such as the Philippine Navy, and the French Navy and the US Navy so that we can also operate properly in actual missions. 
The interoperability developed through such opportunities has worked well on various occasions, which include counter piracy operation in the Middle East and the uh, recent disaster relief activity in response to the underwater volcanic eruption near Tongo. In particular, we conducted various activities for Tonga centering around the Coordination Center in Australia. I believe that it is one of the tremendous achievements made possible by our engagement in Kakadu. Additionally, a JMSDF ship protected the Royal Australian Navy ship last year, which demonstrated high-end interoperability between Japan and Australia. In such an increasing complicated and severe security environment, it is impossible for any single country to maintain peace and stability on its own. Each country, especially each Navy, has to work hand in hand with other navies on our common challenges. Therefore, I believe that it is critically important for us, I mean navies, to develop our interoperability and share our, share our common challenges through the exercise Kakadu. Taking this opportunity, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to the Royal Australian Navy for leading a series of Kakadu, as well as providing the previous opportunity for a conference like this. So next, it is our turn. So we will host the WPNS in November 2022 in Yokohama, which has a long history of maritime trade like Sydney, coupled with a multilateral exercise and uh, the International Free Trade Review commemorating the, our 70th anniversary of JMSDF. We are looking forward to uh, your visit to Japan. Thank you for your kind attention. That's all. Uh, thank you very much, Captain Yukoda. Uh, it's a great pleasure now to invite uh, Admiral Robert Clark, the Vice Commander of the US 7th Fleet, to uh, address us. Admiral Clark joined the United States Navy through uh, the Aviation uh, Candidate School and was designated an, a Naval Flight Op Officer. He has operated in every geographic com uh, combatant command and has logged over 3,000 flight hours. He served uh, in a variety of positions ashore, including Chief, um, the US 6th Fleet, Chief of, um, Chief of Staff Naval Reserve Office, Deputy Commander Naval Region, uh, Mid-Atlantic Reserve Component. As a flag officer, he has served as Deputy Commander Military Sea Lift Command and Deputy Director of Operations, Strategic Plans Policy. He's a, a graduate of the Naval War College, Joint Forces College, holds post-graduate uh, degrees in a variety of areas, and is currently serving as the Vice Commander, US 7th Fleet. Sir. Thank you, Admiral, for that uh, nice introduction. As a US president once said, uh, my father would have appreciated it and my mother would have believed it. So, um, so I'm, I'm here uh, about a month ago. Uh, I got an invite to uh, talk about Kakadu, and uh, we do a lot of exercises in the 7th Fleet. So I had to ask our Australian officer, uh, Lieutenant Commander David Hodge, who's in the uh, um, audience. Um, a little bit about cockadoo, and the first thing he says, you need to learn how to say it. It's not cockadoo, it's cackadoo. Um, and then I did a little Googling, and, and he said it's not an Australian uh, uh, hat either, and he explained uh, more about it. So uh, with that said, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. What a great time to be back in Australia. And on behalf of Vice Admiral Thomas, the commander of U.S. 7th Fleet, I'm pleased to speak with our friends in the Royal Australian Navy and to our regional partners in the audience. A special thanks to Vice Admiral uh, Mike Noonan, our gracious host for this week, for the invitation to reflect on this partnership between our navies and to share a few thoughts on its future trajectory. And certainly, like many of you, the US Navy and the Royal Australian Navy have a rich history of cooperation. We are friends and close allies at sea, sharing an active commitment for the stability, security, and respect for sovereignty in the Indo-Pacific. Exercise Kakadu, Australia's largest maritime exercise, reflects Australia's leadership and a vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific region, one without the course of exercise of power by any one Navy or country. In 1993, the first edition of Kakadu uh, was envisioned to foster a strength and strengthen effective security 
and humanitarian partnerships with six nations, which later expanded to 27 nations in 2018. The exercise area near Darwin is a natural gateway to the South China Sea, the Indo-Pacific's economic center of gravity with trillions of dollars in annual trade flowing through it. The complex training scenarios undertaken in Kakadu have emphasized the need to seamlessly integrate warfighting expertise and to project ships and forces when required. It has also instilled a sense of common purpose and teamwork among the participants in a region prone to stressful natural weather and geologic events. Kakadu's premise resonates even stronger today as was the evident in the rapid response following the devastating eruption of the volcano in Tonga. Regional and international partners quickly mobilized humanitary, uh, emergency humanitarian assistance during this crisis, and we hope the 2022 edition of Kakadu will build upon this solidarity of effort as our navies expand like-minded partnerships and together enforce and uphold a rules-based international order amidst the growing geopolitical and maritime challenges in this region. The U.S. Navy first joined Kakadu in 2016 and returned in 2018 in enduring determination to improve our maritime interoperability with Australia and other international partners. In addition to sharpening our military partnerships, Kakadu's ethos also advances greater collaboration with civilian institutions. This confluence enables military readiness and, in, and sustains prosperous societies by acting quickly and decisively when required to mobilize for action. It permits closer civilian security collaboration to meet challenges ranging from counter narcotics trade that negatively impact communities to combating illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing, which is essential to protecting the livelihood of law-abiding people who depend on the seas for personal and economic benefit. It strengthens the human rights protections afforded by international law when encountering migrants at sea and those held hostage in forced labor. It also affords an improved understanding of gender perspectives through the Women, Peace, and Security Initiative when encountering victims of human trafficking at sea. Clearly, all this ultimately strengthens maritime governance while improving the framework of rules, processes, and systems involving the jurisdiction from local to international stakeholders. In Kakadu 2022, the participating maritime professionals must realize that the maritime commons are increasingly contested. They are being challenged by an increasingly capable and an assertive People's Republic of China. The PRC has demonstrated that it will enter into opaque agreements that disproportionately advantage the PRC to achieve its national object objectives, raising regional security concerns due to the purpose, scope, and lack of transparency of these agreements. The PRC has also engaged in gray zone activities, such as deploying maritime militia to the exclusive economic zones of other countries and sending maritime law enforcement vessels to assert false administrative con control over disputed island features. For the PRC, this is in pursuit of an external environment more favorable to their hegemonic goals and induced by altering the regional status quo in a favor with in its favor with a desire to act below the threshold of uh, military, military, militarized response. In the era of global strategic competition, it is paramount that the like-minded international community work together to keep the maritime commons free of malign influence, and that maritime commons remains accessible to anyone willing to abide by the rules, norms, and standards enshrined in international law. Clearly, we're starting to make traction in the information domain with this challenge. Kakadu, as a multinational effort led by Australia, enables this shared understanding of international law and the responsibility of maritime nations within its framework. By working with each other, we can deter Beijing's increasingly provocative effort to bully and to subvert the international system to suit its authoritarian preferences and, if necessary, respond with credible force when required. 
One challenge that is common to all of us is climate change, and because of it, we will encounter unexpected problems. Thus, we must train to be prepared for scenarios beyond humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. For example, navies must better understand archipelagic migration patterns resulting from food and water insecurity and lean forward on infrastructure planning that incorporates climate change adaptation in their communities to build resilience. This is a global problem that will require concerted response, and we, our allies and partners, must be prepared to do what is necessary to address and mitigate climate change security risks. With the diversity and huge geographical expanse of the Indo-Pacific, a collective security cooperation approach is necessary, perhaps with a slightly nuanced focus in combating transboundary threats throughout. We are a stronger team when we all sail together, and it's always to our advantage to cultivate these partnerships that enhance the security and stability of the entire region. In the South and East China Seas, the heart of our strategic com competition, capable navies must forcefully counteract the relentless effort by regional competitors to bend, break, and replace the universal understanding of international law and its own interpretation. For example, despite the 2016 arbitration ruling in favor of the Philippines, Beijing refuses to recognize the decision and continues to use intimidation and bullying to undermine the sovereign rights of Southeast Asia coastal states in the South China Sea. In our collective effort, we must fly, steam, and sail freely wherever international law permits. In the Indian Ocean, we must leverage the ge geographic advantages of our willing partners, such as India, to blunt the malign and exploitative influence of the regional competitors there. In the South Pacific and Oceania, where, Oceania, where Australia, New Zealand, and France have naturally a primary and longstanding roots, we should use these enduring partnerships in the region to stand firm against Beijing's subversive, subversive tactics and predatory economics. For many of our international partners, the training and exposure received during the exercise is invaluable. Understanding the varying level of capability and capacity among the participants, the broad exercise objectives are spot on. There is no substitute being involved together in doing the work to improve together. We call that a force multiplier. Hands-on learning from each other's experience is what Kakadu is all about, whether it's high seas search and rescue techniques, or clearance diving procedures for inspecting peer infrastructure. Building relationships on shared knowledge, learning, and experience will pay dividends. And most importantly, it will increase our understanding of each other, which works to build the most important attribute of any relationship, trust. The list of maritime threats we face today is growing and we must remain committed to action to protect the shared global commons. Exercises like Kakadu provide a platform for ongoing dialogue and the participants can benefit from frequent engagement with capable and experienced partners in understanding the dynamic maritime domain and prioritizing action. Our friends will find advantages from enduring institutional capacity, building support provided by various external organizations with a chance to practice some of the required skills uh, during events like Kakadu. For many, comprehensive maritime domain awareness is 50% of the answer. And I believe that maritime domain, domain awareness is one of our most urgent needs. This can work with subject matter experts from the United States, Australia, Japan, and France, for example, to analyze and understand satellite imagery that is now available from open source technologies. Information sharing initiatives such as Sea Vision and the European Union funded IORIS can facilitate secure maritime coordination and communication with interagency, national, and regional stakeholders. That sort of close collaboration is key to defining a team that adheres to the rules of law and acts by, with, and through our collective strength whenever malign actors attempt to circumvent the established framework for their self selfish and unfair gain. We all know that a common operating picture is worth a thousand words. 
You know, when we talk about a free and open Indo-Pacific, we often do not codify what act that actually means. It's an idea, an idea of freedom, free of intimidation and coercion, upholding the rights and agreements and requiring everybody to pave in accordance with international law. It's not a groundbreaking sentiment. Strong and united partnerships embodied in Kakadu give a voice to our friends who are otherwise easily disparaged and silenced by regional actors who feel that the respect for other sovereignty is optional. As the pandemic has shown, some of these challenges are too important and too large for any one single country to take on solely. It is imperative that we collaborate with institutions like ASEAN and the Pacific Island Forum, while also reinvigorating multilateral security partnerships like the Quad to generate the integrated deterrence needed to prevent armed conflict by raising the political and economic costs of the conflict. Additionally, Additionally, fielding advanced capabilities such as the AUKUS initiative, uh, guided by shared values and ideals, will promote the security and defense interests that the entire region can benefit from. The 2022 list of Kak uh, Kakadu uh, participants shows the inclusivity and the reach of Kakadu and navies that share this commitment to peace and stability. My, my boss, Vice Admiral Thomas, has always said, and I've always shared this, his sentiment, we are stronger when we sail together. And it's no secret that Beijing is determined to ex exert its influence wherever it can, however it can, to achieve its national objectives. Unfortunately, it's a zero-sum proposition, and it will be at the expense of others, and we must not allow that to happen. I've talked a lot about building a team team that should make regional misbehaving actors think twice before confronting this team for its own selfish gains. In the past three decades, Kakadu has already charted the course with a robust 27-nation na engagement in 2018. I'm hoping this year we might see 30. And as we expand our collective security, let's sharpen our skills so we are more effective, better connected, mutually supported, and highly lethal if and when necessary. And top it all off, we must strive for strong and cohesive messaging in the information space, which instills doubts in the adversary's thoughts and affects their decision cycle, thinking perhaps that maybe today is not the day. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, sir. Uh, I guess one of the key things I saw that you used the word trust uh, that's been a recurrent theme throughout the day. Uh, I think it was our PNG partners this morning that really were really stressing that in the first session. Trust is the centre of everything. Um, we'll go now to our final uh, address this afternoon. We've deliberately switched around the keynote to be the, the concluding uh, component of this panel uh, to basically summarise the day and bring the, bring the, the past together, but really set, it, set the vision for the, uh, the future as well. With great pleasure, introduce our Commodore Jonathan Early, the Deputy Fleet Commander. Thanks, Andrew. I appreciate you not reading out my bio. <laughs> um, look, I appreciate I'm the last person standing between you and your networking functions and so forth, uh, and I'll be as quick as I possibly can. But as Andrew's mentioned, uh, my job today is pretty much to tell you what's about to hap happen with Kakadu 22. Uh, so this year's iteration of the exercise. So without further ado, we'll kick off. So distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and certainly a, a very warm welcome to our international and regional visitors that are here today, and also to my fellow panellists who've given us some pretty insightful views about uh, Kakadu and also about regional security. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I also pay my respects to those Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and women who serve or who have served in the defence of Australia in times of peace and war. Today it's my pleasure on behalf of the Commander Australian Fleet to talk to you today about Kakadu 2022 and have a quick chat about how it will contribute to regional stability in the future. You've already heard from previous speakers about the history of Kakadu as our, one of our key international exercises. I think many of the background themes you've heard uh, many of the lived experiences you've heard from the various nations that have participated since its inception uh, 
but also some of the academic analysis that's been offered over the course of the day. I think a lot of those things that you've heard will hopefully resonate with what I have to say over the next few minutes. There you go. Kakadu is the RN's most significant engagement we have with regional navies. Uh, and as time has gone on, the geographic engagement has only increased. Uh, as you've heard, in the 2018 iteration, we had the United Arab Emirates uh, participate, as well as Vietnam. And in this year's exercise, we're going to see Germany, Germany uh, participate for the first time through the provision of some Typhoon uh, fighter aircraft and also some air refuelers. But with growth comes complexity in the conduct of the exercise, and it's certainly, as Admiral Jones mentioned this morning, it is becoming an increasingly uh, difficult challenge to ensure that participants, whether in the sea, uh, on the sea, under the sea, or over the sea, or observing from exercise control, derive the greatest benefit from the concentration of so many assets that we have. This will be the 15th iteration, and we are planning to provide a very rich training environment through the conduct of a series of activities, both at sea and ashore, that will provide significant operational benefits to all participants, whether you've come from a short distance or whether or not you've come from a long distance uh, away from Australia. Looking towards the themes, as we've heard today, Kakadu provides an important embodiment of Australia's strategic message of regional partnership and collaboration. You know, there's a couple of words that we've heard multiple times today. That working closely together promotes understanding, familiarity and trust. And it certainly goes without saying that without these qualities, we are weakened as a collective. But with these traits, we can become stronger and demonstrate the value of unity and of a rules-based global order. Operating as an effective coalition of maritime forces is the primary focus of this and, and has been for every Kakadu exercise. The 2022 exercise will provide participating nations with the opportunity to deepen their professional skills across the full spectrum of maritime operations. The main attraction of uh, Kakadu 22 is that participating nations will get the opportunity to exercise across both maritime and air domains, focusing on an array of disciplines and activities, including anti-submarine warfare, weapon firings, surface warfare, air defence, as well as logistics management at sea, constabulary operations and information warfare. Where we can, our intent will be to draw upon the richness that comes from such a diverse array of multinational forces, where each nation brings specific experience and skill sets to the exercise. The objectives for Kakadu 22 can be distilled into three main areas. Firstly, there's the promotion of regional engagement. And as we've heard in other sessions during the Sea Power Conference, and against the backdrop of uh, an increasingly complex and contested region, our ability to establish strong, meaningful relationships to best interact and interoperate effectively cannot be overstated. The second objective focuses on interoperability, another term we've heard repeatedly throughout the today uh, on this subject. This aspect is not limited to operations at sea, I might add but also ashore in the preparation and planning phases, whether that be, be during the initial, mid or final planning conferences that we do, or even during the harbour, harbour briefing program, which I'll talk about in a minute. Kakadu seeks to involve member nations in as many preparation aspects as possible. This will also include the allocation of personnel from participating nations to specific positions within the exercise control uh, construct, or the white cell for want of a better term. Systematic planning up front provides valuable learning and a shared vision for all participants, which can then easily be translated to better interoperability outcomes at sea or in the air. So we put the work in up front, the execution when we're out in the field uh, will tell the tale. For the Australian participants, the biggest learning opportunity will gain an understanding of the approaches of other nations and how they execute the planning process. So don't just think our way is the best way of doing it. We certainly encourage all our participating nations when they come to join us uh, offer your ideas up, different ways of doing things. This is a collaborative effort. Oops. And sorry, the last objective concerns personnel exchanges I've missed from the previous slide. The exchange of personnel across the differing nations is a key outcome of Kakadu, and in my experience, the opportunity to be exposed to a different navy or a different ship or a different aircraft and certainly a different culture is often remarked upon as a career highlight that we seek to share with our partners and who doesn't love a jumping crocodile on the Adelaide River. Exercise activity. As has been in previous iterations, there'll be two phases to Kakadu 22. The harbour phase, which includes various briefs covering operational safety, communications, quarantine and customs, 
requirements, there's a number of sporting and cultural events to provide ships, companies and air crew with opportunities to gather exchange experiences. This will also include local advice on what to experience in Darwin and its environs. And already today we've had a number of our, our regional guests uh, certainly exclaim how great it's been for the cultural program part of Kakadu 22, of the Kakadu exercise, exercise and we'll certainly aim to replicate that again in September. I'll also add that this phase will inclu include a regional fleet commanders conference hosted by Commander Australian Fleet, which I'll talk about shortly. And lastly, the sea phase, as the name suggests, will provide the opportunity for participating nations to conduct the full range of maritime activity from constabulary operations through to high-end war fighting as required. As mentioned earlier, the harbour phase will also include the Fleet Commanders Conference. Commander Australian Fleet is very much looking forward to hosting his counterparts uh, toward, at the end of the year during this harbour phase. And while the agenda for this conference is still being finalised, a rough agenda of topics to be covered is offered on the slide. You, and, and will no doubt provide a great opportunity for our invited guests to discuss security and significant issues in the region. So to give you an idea of who's been invited so far to Kakadu 22, the slide provides some detail on the flags of the 34-odd nations uh, which, the, which you might likely see uh, at the end of the year. And the key point there, it's going to be quite a sizeable exercise. And while we're still finalising some of the responses we've received or so far to Kakadu 22, of the 34 nations invited, we can expect to see a significant array of maritime and air assets uh, concentrate in Darwin this September. And as you can see on the screen, uh, the assets range every, everything from uh, helicopter detachments through to fourth, fifth generation fighter aircraft, destroyers, frigates, OPVs, patrol boats. It's going to be quite the exercise. So what's Australia bringing? At this stage, Australia's uh, contribution for Kakadu 22 is as shown. The variety of ships and aircraft that will participate from our point of view will certainly ensure that a high-end war fighting elements are exercised across whether that be undersea or air warfare. So the future of Kakadu. I've touched on the future of Kakadu a little bit, but a bit more detail. There are three focal points for the future. Firstly, the key, uh, key point is to increase participation. Conducting an exercise with this many participating nations certainly sends a strong strategic message to the world, and particularly potential adversaries about increasing levels of cooperation between the nations that play. In short, the more the better. The second point, is there is opportunity here to increase the level of sophistication and capability of the exercise amongst the participating nations, as detailed on the slide. And the last, the final element, uh, will be to increase the range of maritime war fighting and logistics uh, competencies as we become more proficient in that, again, as spelt out on the slide. So to conclude, let me leave you with three clear messages about what we see overall as the future of Kakadu, and I like to think this kind of sums up uh, what we've heard throughout the course of today. So first one, Kakadu will continue to be the Australian showpiece for multinational maritime exercises in this region. This exercise is not going away, it is something that is going to be continued to be supported by us into the future. Number two, the number of invited nations will increase, as will the level of maritime capability. This will allow each nation, Australia included, to learn from the rich level of knowledge and experience that will come from such a diverse range of nations, along with their respective cultures, to learn how to operate effectively as a coalition force. And the last key message, when cooperating together, we send a clear strategic message to the world of an increasing level of unity among participating nations who remain resolute in the preservation of peace and stability in our region. Again, themes which have been echoed by my fellow panellists here today, uh, not just in this session, but in previous ones uh, as well. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. OK, thank you to the panel. Uh, as we start to open up questions, uh, I might just hand back to the chair to uh, summarise and bring together some of the key points before we open up for questions. Okay, I'll um, once again be brief. Um, I'm aware that I'm standing, as you said, between you and, and, and potentially some refreshing beverage or, or similar. Um, but I thought there were some really interesting things that have, have come out and, and, and um, 
things that we might want to sort of discuss a little bit further. Uh, the first of, of which was coming uh, in some ways from Captain uh, Yogatata, um, which is about the idea that the coalition operations are very much in Navy's blood. Um, they've been doing it for a long time, um, and this is, is just part of, of sort of building on that. And as a historian, that, that's very much uh, uh, something that, that I would, would, would agree and endorse. Um, the other thing which has come through throughout uh, this from a number of different panelists uh, representing different regional countries is the importance of, of maritime security operations and um, HADR type operations uh, within the different regional contexts. Um, this has been a, something that's been mentioned as a priority by a number of, of, of different panelists, um, including my, my colleague from, or um, uh, the, the panelist from, from Brunei. Um, but I think it was really interesting then to, to look at how that perhaps plays upper level um, and, and what we heard from, from Rear Admiral Clark about how uh, things like reinforcing the good order, at, the good order at sea and maintaining the rules-based order in this increasingly competitive world is not merely about maritime security, it is also about something else as well um, and can be seen through both of those lenses and shouldn't perhaps be, sometimes we, we tend to view constabulary operations as just constabulary operations and then there's other things that happen in a competitive world, and, and perhaps that's, that's not quite um, as binary as, as we think. Um, and I was very interested uh, with the, the comment you, you put in at the end there about the information space. Um, I think that's something that, again, has come through throughout this, about how we actually talk about exercises, how we sell exercises. And in a country where everyone jokes about the idea of Australia being girt by beach um, rather than girt by sea, Actually, how do we talk to people about what Navy does? Our exercise is an opportunity to do that. Um, and I thought I'd probably end up coming back to um, uh, Captain Hunt's idea, which I, I really liked as a way of uh, sort of summing this up, which is talking about cultural understandings. Um, the region, I think we really got this from um, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Um, Strathing's presentation earlier, and more broadly, the region does not look at the world um, in a single unified way. Different countries do have different perspectives and we kind of have to accept that. Um, but I think there is a, a generally um, shared set of aims and outlooks. And actually developing a cultural understanding can help frame a way of going about and a way of operating, whether in things like maritime security, um, that, that will then allow us to uh, sort of move forward and perhaps push back against some of the people who don't share those kind of aims and outlooks. Thank you. Uh, we've got the first question come through. Um, we'll throw it to our um, Commander Joffrin from uh, Brunei. Now, we are conscious that you've only got to go stand on a beach in Brunei and you are in the South China Sea. Um, the question relates to Kakadu and how Brunei has been able to use Kakadu and other exercises to demonstrate your full operating capabilities. Hello. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, sir. Yes, uh, when uh, we first participated in uh, Exercise Kakadu in 2012, uh, we had just, uh, at that time, uh, acquired our new uh, patrol vessels, uh, Katie Bidro Laman. And uh, we had her participate in Exercise Kakadu with the vast um, availability of assets during that day, uh, during this, this exercise. We had um, participation from, I think, the Air Force um, uh, fighter jets. Uh, we had a lot of surface firing that we, co that we, have, uh, conduct we had conducted. And that all actually uh, instilled a level of, uh, high level of training for us uh, for the new acquired ship. And also to test uh, the crew uh, comp competency at that time. So that was uh, uh, very helpful for uh, the ship. Um, going towards uh, its full operational capability. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Uh, the next question, uh, direct to uh, Captain Hun. Uh, I guess it relates to sort of uh, how, do you, how does Kakadu help navies do hard things? And I just probably reflect on the fact that the New Zealand Navy has probably had an opportunity to focus on your non-service combatant capabilities for, uh, for the last uh, little while, sort of with increased focus. So I guess, where do you see the opportunities to do hard things and, and what might you have learned about your own Navy as a result of sort of that increased focus? 
Sure, thanks. Thanks for that question. Uh, look, <clears throat> uh, at, the, at the current point, uh, our Navy has had a bit of a capability gap in terms of the frigates. So the last time we were in Kakadu was 2018, and uh, we're just emerging out of a large upgrade uh, period for that. So our emphasis is actually back uh, into high-end war fighting uh, to make sure that we can realise the benefits of the investment we've placed into upgrading our ANZAC-class frigates. Uh, so for that, we need to um, really place quite a lot of em emphasis there because actually our challenge is actually more around our people and our capacity in rebuilding those warfighting skill sets that, while I enjoyed that at a, on a high, um, we've, we've sort of had a little bit of a skill fade and COVID hasn't really helped us in that space, nor has a buoyant employment uh, market either. Um, so the challenge for us really is to recreate that warfighting culture uh, and ethos and exercise kakadu is 100% the right place to do that. Um, and, and I hope uh, we get invited again for the opportunity to command because I guess everybody wants that because that's actually where you really, really get to understand the cultural uh, piece of you know the flock inside your task group and understand how other navies think and fight and how you can best utilise the diverse effects that you have inside that task group to deliver the effect. So some of that knowledge is still resident. We've just got to get it through our younger uh, wharf officers and commanding officers as we rebuild our capacity uh, as we bring these uh, upgraded frigates back into service. I hope that answered your question. That's cool. And just acknowledging that you've done a huge amount of work with your diving and, and your, yes. your resupply capabilities in that time. Yes. Um, I just might leverage a little bit of where you talked about. You talked about the desire for frequent command and control opportunities for development, and that's been a common theme through the day. So I guess if I go to um, Commodore Early, just given the fact that you've been previous Director General, uh, Director of Operations, you've, you've got the extensive ops at sea and ashore. In designing future exercises, where do you see the opportunity not only to do the exercise part itself, but in the connecting legs between exercises? Um, Admiral Jones mentioned this morning that Kakadu was designed to help be the, the natural flow for forces back from RIMPAC. But as you build these command and control opportunities, ships in transit for these longer ocean passages, is there an opportunity there to actually sort of build some of those longer lasting frameworks um, that, that endure? Yeah, look, I think uh, we're always looking for those opportunities. I think the challenge uh, that we have right now is the demand signal for maritime forces is high. Um, the commitment we have for various operations and activities, particularly in our region, kind of dictates to a certain degree um, where we send those assets. Um, and if there's an opportunity to get some exercise value out of it in those transition pieces, well, we'll certainly uh, capitalise that. But uh, availability of ships uh, and platforms to participate in, in those sorts of things, um, that's another factor. We're going through a major recapitalisation of the fleet at the moment with various upgrades and that takes time. Um, where I see the greater value is our participation uh, and encouragement of uh, the very, and as I mentioned in my, in my speech there, the opportunities that are inherent in the planning conferences, making sure that you know, we have buy-in from everyone that is participating in those. Uh, and we're learning from them uh, such that when we do get the opportunity to get together in the field training environment, we actually can maximise the value. So we're not just simply conducting manoeuvring exercises, we're working our way up on a positive trajectory in terms of capability and sophistication. That's where I think the va real value is going to be initially. Um, the better we do that in the planning, the better outcome we'll get it. We'll get it. See when we get together. Now, clearly, there's some maritime mariner aspects of that we still need to maintain. You can't only do that when you're at sea. But I think uh, where we're going with sophistication of exercises, interoperability, interchangeability. If you want to introduce a new term there, um, more of those planning opportunities, getting staffs together to work out how do we get there is the better is the, is, the, is the key. Um, I might go to um, Captain Yokota. Um, just given the fact that Australia and Japan have just signed reciprocal access agreement and really taking that relationship forward, uh, do you see opportunity in future Kakadus to be able to explore and expand some of those relationships to test that and build that capacity? Well, 
Okay, I think the RA is a big, uh, uh, big challenge to expand our uh, relationship. So the Kakadu, uh, I think the, uh, we are uh, participated uh, by just the navies, but the RA uh, will uh, affect on the ground self-defense force and air self-defense force. So the, I think the uh, big step for the RAA is uh, participating by the, uh, our other services of the self-defense force. Uh, I might just uh, pivot to and use a, uh, a theme that came out of the previous one, which was talking about some of the big security architecture that's uh, informing the Indo-Pacific and the uh, contest for ideas and, and uh, opportunities and the threats and opportunities. And, and just use the fact that um, Admiral Clark, you know, representing the US and uh, as a truly a global power, um, where do you think, I think when we look at the Indo-Pacific, we're seeing, we traditionally fall into an east-west view of the, the traditional focus. But is there anything happening in the polar regions that uh, may or may not influence the security architectures and where we might need to take future designs, particularly in some of the non-traditional threats? I'll admit I'm uh, not an expert on the polar region, um, although I, I know that um, it, it is opening up. Uh, the, one of the difficulties with the polar region is uh, the, uh, the environment uh, requires uh, a fair amount of uh, ability to um, do uh, search and rescue up there. And the infrastructure is not yet set up for that. So it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, I have looked at the, um, when I was at US Transcom, the transit routes and uh, to actually cut down on the transit time over through the Arctic, uh, you, you, your route has to basically start north of Japan. Otherwise, it's just as efficient to take the southern route. Um, so I think that the polar region is uh, an area where uh, it really hasn't been exploited yet by countries. And so there, there are resources up there. So I would expect it to become uh, you know, an, an area in the future where uh, uh, it is also contested as well. And certainly our Navy is, is looking, at, looking at how we may uh, operate up there uh, more uh, than we have. We, we have operated up there uh, quite a bit, um, being an Arctic nation as well as Canada and, and uh, Russia and a, and a few other countries. Uh, because I guess the, the non-traditional threats, and we're talking about some of the climate change, but the, the search and rescue responsibilities, we're conscious we've got uh, responsibility for 10% of the world's ocean, including the southern ocean spaces. New Zealand are quite active uh, down in the Antarctic. So it's just some of those things to, to think about when we look at the Indo-Pacific. Um, a question to the, uh, the panel, I think, as we wrap it up, would be um, just your final comments on how each of you believe that Kakadu represents your Navy's uh, shared values and, and optimism for the future. Um, perhaps, sir, we start, start with you. Well, I think uh, for Kakadu, um, you know, I've, I've been in the uh, military for almost 33 years, and I've seen a fair amount of um, war during that time, uh, specifically back in uh, Bosnia. I still remember going through uh, Sarajevo right after the... Uh, um, Dayton Accords, and so um, my my eternal hope is that we will not see conflicts in the future. Um, but that probably is not the reality. And so for Kakadu, um, I'm I'm really um, hopeful that for the leadership uh, that we really stress um, the learning aspect of it with our junior officers and junior enlisted. And, and the reason being is, that, you know, if you've read uh, Neptune's Inferno or the biography of Chesty Polar, um, in Neptune's Inferno, there's a, a, a lieutenant commander, Lloyd Mustin, who's a, uh, who really trains his uh, uh, folks in, in gunnery. 
And in, in that book, it talks about the success that Lloyd Mustin had because of the training he uh, did with his junior uh, personnel. And then also in the biography of uh, one of our most uh, revered uh, Marines, uh, General Chesney Puller, he also was one that drilled his, his Marines um, to a high degree. And so we need to make sure that the future of our Navy is prepared. And so when we uh, have a young um, officer up on the bridge um, in these exercises, uh, let's just remember that they're our future and that it's really important that they get a lot of training value out of the exercise and that as leaders, we, um, we, we make sure that it's really relevant and in depth. Uh, we might go to um, the book end of the table, down to uh, Captain Hun. Thanks very much. Uh, so I think I kind of said it in my, in my speech, but just to reinforce uh, for the Royal New Zealand Navy, New Zealand Defence Force and uh, New Zealand, um, Kakadu really does provide the opportunity for us to learn and understand how both Australia and our other warfighters think uh, and fight. And I think... Well, I'm not going leading with the people conversation now, I'm saying it is about the thinking and fighting because I do have a belief myself personally that um, things are deteriorating and we need to be prepared for that. That said, I did say the key enablers were around maintaining people-to-people uh, -people relationships and building that trust and cultural understanding. You've got to do that in parallel so that you're kind of ready, but also um, uh, you really, really hope that this work over this side uh, means that you don't have to fight but you can't not be ready. Uh, so I think New Zealand and Australia have a long shared tradition, shared values, a feared, uh, shared ideas on our regional security and Exercise Kakadu is a great platform for us to be able to um, share those ideas and uh, leverage our long-standing relationship. Thank you. Uh, Captain Yukota. Yes. I have four values we see four values in Kakadu. First one is respect for other countries are able at Kakadu to share their challenges, uh, their uh, uh, values, uh, and uh, uh, the sense of uh, values that we can share. ふたつ目は、我々が今様々な海域で実施しているオペレーションやグレーゾーンでのアクティビティについて、そのノウハウを参加の各国の方に提供できるということです。the second uh, point is that uh, we do uh, discuss uh, various operational activities and activities in the gray zones, and uh, through Kakadu, uh, we are able to uh, um, impart our uh, know-how uh, uh, on how uh, that can be applied, and we can uh, share that know-how with the participants uh, at Kakadu. ミッツメがあ、同じ価値観、ライク、ライクマインディッチカントリーで、え、ワークトゥギャザーするというようなポスチャーをしっかり世界に発信をして、ルールベースのルールベースでの世界というのは非常に重要だということを説明できるということです。um, thirdly, it uh, gives us the uh, opportunity to talk about the, the like-mindedness um, and for us to be able to work together, uh, that being a posture that uh, we should uh, uh, implement uh, in the world uh, today. Uh, and it gives us, gives us the opportunity to emphasize uh, the importance in relation to that uh, for a rules-based world. 最後に4つ目が我々が日米である総合運用性を総合代替性インターチェンジアビリティに発展させるために、オーストラリアや米国、イギリス、そしてニュージーランドといった国がどのような爆力活動、プランニング等をして対等なインターチェンジアビリティを
The uh, fourth uh, point uh, is the interoperability that we have, for example, between Japan and the U.S., and uh, um, interoperability that we have between Japan and the U.S., uh, US and uh, develop that to interchangeability uh, so that we can work together with uh, countries such as Australia, U.S., U.K., uh, and uh, um, uh, New Zealand, um, and uh, uh, also uh, work on uh, how, how we can um, make uh, plans and uh, uh, if make further developments for uh, tight-knit uh, um, uh, interchangeability. Um, and uh, uh, Kakadu actually gives us the opportunity to convey that message to the young officers uh, uh, as, as well, and that, I believe, is an important thing. Uh, Commander Joffrey. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, just to highlight uh, some of the points uh, from our Navy on uh, exercise Kakadu. Um, we are grateful that uh, it has given us, Kakadu, uh, the opportunity uh, to build trust and confidence uh, by exercising with uh, participating nations, improving uh, interoperability uh, through the high intense uh, warfare serials that have uh, been conducted during the exercise. And at the same time, uh, the opportunity for us to uh, exercise with all these uh, facilities and assets that are not readily available with, within our, our armed forces. So that is uh, a very big uh, a bonus for us. Um, our, my next highlight would possibly be uh, interpersonal ties, uh, as has been highlighted throughout uh, this uh, conference, um, and linked to how to improve the exercise. I think uh, maybe to introduce a more dedicated uh, junior officer and junior sailors program because uh, friendship is important, it's the future. And also uh, friendship amongst the young uh, is important because that, that will be uh, future. Thank you, sir. Commodore Early, sir. Okay, I'll keep mine pretty straightforward. One of the key themes of sea power has been if it's maritime, it matters. It's pretty simple. I think Kakadu fits that bill as an underpinning base rock exercise in which gives truth to that saying, if it's maritime, it matters. Why do I say that? It breeds familiarity. All the issues that the panellists have said today, it allows us to engage, allows us to understand one another. So <clears throat> both at a senior level and a junior level. It builds trust. When we work together, we have a shared vision of what success looks like. And when we have a shared vision and we all work towards it, we work better together. Lastly, it builds confidence such that when or if we are called into action to act decisively, to act together, we can do so in a very timely manner. So that's the value I see from Kakadu overall. If it's maritime, if it's one thing you, you should have learnt from today, if it's maritime, it matters. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, finally, uh, Dr Dunley. Oh, I, I really don't feel I can add very much to, uh, to, to what's been said by, by the very distinguished panel um, beyond the, the fact that, that we've heard a huge amount about this exercise, about how it's grown, um, and the things which have, have come through really clearly uh, in terms of, of cultural understanding, personal relationships, um, and the importance of this going forward, um, which I think is, is, is what's sort of come through uh, very clearly uh, in, in the final remarks there. Um, so I'm not going to keep you any longer than that. Well, thank you very much. Can we just have one last final uh, round of applause for our speakers, but also on behalf, in their absence, all the speakers for today who did a great job. So we hope those four panels have taken you over a 30-year journey, have challenged you, given you some uh, different uh, food for thought, uh, perhaps some different perspectives. But I think uh, no matter all of us, no matter rank, role, uniformed or not, we all play a role in influencing the environment and, uh, and underpinning those fundamentals of trust and the relationships we're all trying to build for our navies of the future. Thank you.